Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to week six of your GCSE revision. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at America in the post-war period. So that's from uh, the 1950s. We're going to be looking at some of the cultural developments that happened during the, at that time. Uh, as with the rest of these, you should have this revision sheet that your teacher should have given you. It has a series of questions with key information of this period and then an exam style question. Uh, this one is, which of the following had uh, more impact on post-war American society, McCarthyism or change in popular culture? This is a 12 mark question. So this is longer than the last two of these you've done. What you need to do for this one is to have a P paragraph on McCarthyism and uh, how that changed American society. A P paragraph on popular culture and how that changed American society. And you need to support both with lots of specific detailed examples such as names, events and statistics. Uh, you should also consider the achievements and the limitations of each movement if you can. Uh, for top marks, you need to uh, make sure, firstly, you reach a substantiated judgment. Now, what do I mean by substantiated judgment? That's not just saying, well, I think it's McCarthyism that had a bigger impact, or I think it's change in popular culture. That's saying that and then backing it up. It's explaining uh, why you've made that judgment. And that can be based on some of the evidence that you've talked about already in those first two paragraphs. Um, and to really get those top marks, you need to think about how the two might connect together. How does um, incorporating both into your ideas? So does um, the, something to do with McCarthyism suggest that popular culture was less effective or vice versa? How do the two work together? So that's uh, how you can show the higher level thinking and get into the uh, highest marks for this question. So what you should do now is you should pause this video, go away and answer all these questions. Um, oh, I forgot to say, you'll need these pages of the revision guide, 44 to 49. So now that you've got those that revision guide, go away and complete these questions and have a go at completing the exam question. And then come back to the video at this point and I will talk through a completed version that I did earlier. Okay, so welcome back. This is uh, my completed version. So what we're gonna do now is just talk through the answers I gave for all of these, uh, and then we'll talk through a model answer for that exam question. So starting off at the top here, 1950s American dream. Uh, so this is one of the, the big factors of uh, this period of history is a new emergence of this idea of the American dream. So the first question asks you to describe 1950s society using the following words. So what I've done is I've just written a paragraph describing American society, and you can see those key words I've put in bold. So I'll read this out for you. Uh, after the war, American life began to return to normal. Companies that had so much success selling war products started producing consumer goods, such as cars and TVs, in the same efficient way. So when we talked last uh, lesson about the War Productions Board and how these companies were making weapons so efficiently, they used that same efficient practice and applied it to consumer goods. This meant millions of Americans could afford them and fitted their new homes in suburbia. Uh, so suburbia is the small towns that existed outside of the city that people could move to that were generally very affluent and wealthy and uh, had the, all the advantages of living near a city, but you don't have to live in a city with all of the, you know, the hustle and bustle that comes with that. Um, and they fitted those, those households with modern household goods known as modcons. Uh, this increase in consumerism, so that's uh, another one of the words, so this idea where um, American people are buying more and more goods, uh, where Americans were consuming one third of the world's goods and services. So they were actually um, consuming goods at a rate of, the, of one third of all of the goods that were consumed uh, across the world. So that's obviously a massive amount because America's population uh, is nowhere near one third of the world. 
uh, and that um, consumerism was aided by the baby boom. So there was a massive boom in the amount of babies that were born after the Second World War, partially um, helped by the soldiers returning home after the war and wanting to settle down and start a family. And the buy now, pay later, higher purchase system, which we spoke about a little bit before, where people we would uh, buy buy these goods even if they couldn't afford them, and then pay for it uh, over a period of time in installments. Right, give two examples. The GI Bill helped World War II veterans prosper after the war. So the GI Bill was a bill introduced to uh, help former soldiers. That's who the GIs are. Uh, when they return from the war. And I'll give you three examples here. Uh, and that's established hospitals, made cheap home loans available, and offered grants to pay for university or trade schools. Uh, and who wasn't experiencing the American dream in the 1950s and why? So there's a few different examples that you could talk about with this of people that didn't experience this American dream in the 1950s in the way that some people that were living this suburban lifestyle were able to. Uh, so African-Americans still faced discrimination and Jim Crow laws in many places. So they were still segregated uh, in America's southern states. 25% of people were still living below the poverty line. Um, people in the South were less well off than the North. So uh, the North with its big industrial cities was more prosperous than the South. Uh, the elderly, 68% of whom earns an average income of one quarter of the average factory worker. So the elderly were um, much uh, less well off than the younger people that were employed in factories. The factory workers, uh, whilst very important to this period, weren't exactly the wealthiest people in American society by any stretch. Uh, and also women's employment opportunities and average wages fell back down um, after the gap had been closed during the war. So during the Second World War, because women were doing such important work uh, to keep uh, all of the uh, war machine going in the weapons factories, their wages had began to climb to the point that they, there was a much smaller difference between the average woman's wage and the average man's wage. However, when the men came back from the war, uh, and there was less demand for women to do that work, that gap began to open back up again. So they were um, paid uh, less in comparison to the average man. All right, so we'll move on to our next section now. So the rock and roll generation. So this uh, first question asks us to explain why the 1950s saw the birth of the teenager. So what I've written is, a more prosperous America meant the parents no longer had to insist that their children got jobs to support the family. As America continued to grow, wealthier teenagers had more leisure time and spending power than previous generations. Eventually, these new freer teens got reputations as rebellious and the way they dressed and behaved became far more noticeably different to their parents um, and previous generations, uh, which created what we call a generation gap. I should say. And um, the threat of nuclear disaster also created a live for today culture. So teenagers um, were with this threat that we're going to get to with the Cold War of potential nuclear war. Uh, children and young people were very keen to live for today um, because people didn't know if we were going to go into another war which would go nuclear in a way that uh, had never happened before. So essentially what we've got here is a um, an increase in freedom and uh, like never before young people were much more different in the way they behaved and their interests than that of the older generations. Right, so next it's about explaining the concept of teenage purchasing power and the impact that, that it had on American business. Um, so I've put the average teenager spent between $10 and $15 a week in the 1950s compared to just $1 and $2 in the 1940s. So they had a lot more independent uh, spending ability than they had before because of those things we talked about with a more prosperous America, um, Parents were more willing to give their children uh, 
larger allowances to go and spend on things they wanted to do. Uh, they spent that money on music, cars, fashion, and alcohol. Uh, and this meant that American businesses, realizing that teenagers were someone that you could target with your um, for as a potential customer in a way that they weren't really before, uh, they began advertising specifically to teenagers to cash in on the new purchasing power. So essentially, they started making products, whether those uh, films or um, certain drinks that, that they would target specifically to teenagers in a way they wouldn't really before. Before, they would more target to uh, the parents of those teenagers, hoping that that's something that they would want to get for them. Uh, describe the 1950s teen culture and give examples. So uh, up here, film stars like Marlon Brando, who you may know from the movie The Godfather, and James Dean became emblems of the teenage rebellion with films like Rebel Without a Cause, where the character falls out with his father, drinks and races cars. This inspired new fashion trends such as the greaser look with uh, slicked black hair, denim and leather jackets. A new kind of music that combined country elements with rhythm and blues appealed to young people with its strong rhythms and lyrics that made sexual reference. This creates this was called rock and roll, which was popularized by popularized by Elvis Presley, Little Richard, and Bill Haley and the Comets. Uh, books such as *The Catcher in the Rye* by J.D. Salinger and *On the Road* by Jack Kerouac um, popularized the idea of young people breaking away from tradition and societal expectations in favor of freedom and self-discovery. So we can see here, uh, there's new films, music, fashion, other forms of entertainment like books that talk and target itself specifically to this new idea of freedom and self-expression, uh, which ties in with all this stuff we've been talking about where teenagers are more independent and have their, uh, their own cultural identity that is unique to that of their parents. Right, so next up, uh, the Cold War. Now this is more important when it comes to your conflict and tension in Asia module, but it does play a very significant role in some of the societal developments that happen in uh, this, in the post-war period of American society. So after the Second World War, who were America's main rivals? That was the Soviet Union, which is now uh, known as Russia. Um, and why was it called a cold? War? Why was this rivalry called, called a cold war? Um, and that's because there was no actual armed conflict between the USA and Russia, or the Soviet Union. So there was they got involved in affairs of each other and um, were clear rivals that uh, wanted to get the upper hand on the other country, but they never actually, Russian troops and American troops never actually fought at any point, which is what we would call a hot war. So this is a cold war. So it's much more to do with uh, politics and interfering with other nations that uh, those countries have allies with, but never actually fighting one another directly. So describe the US policy of containment, including the Marshall Plan uh, and the Korean and Vietnam Wars. So after the Second World War, America's one of its big goals was to stop the spread of communism by taking action wherever it could potentially spread. This was as a result of the formation of the Eastern Bloc in Europe following the end of the Second World War. So after the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union sets up uh, lots of communist governments in Eastern Europe. Uh, that became known as the Eastern Bloc. And America, fearful of this and fearful of communism, takes on this policy of containment, uh, where President Truman announced the Truman Doctrine, which had an aim of containing communism. A key part of this was the Marshall Plan, which was introduced to provide aid to war-torn countries in Europe, such as Greece and Turkey, in order to make them less likely to turn to communism. So by giving them aid and helping them rebuild after the war, that means they're less likely to turn to um, uh, extremist governments like uh, communist ones um, and uh, become communist from there. 
And one of the reasons they especially feared this was this idea called domino theory, where they basically thought if one country goes communist, then countries around it are more likely to uh, turn to communism as well. Uh, and they got involved in this in a big way in Asia, which resulted in America becoming involved in armed conflicts in Korea and Vietnam, where they were fighting uh, communist governments in those countries to it, alongside uh, capitalist governments that America preferred in order to keep them in power and prevent those countries from becoming communist. So that's the Cold War. How does that affect American society? The big way, really in the 1950s uh, and late 1940s as well, is as a result of this idea that became known as McCarthyism. So what is meant by McCarthyism? The practice of making accusations of subversion or treason, especially when related to communism, without proper regard for evidence. This is based on the activities of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who claimed to have a list of 200 communists working for the government. He was never able to properly substantiate, um, as I was talking about earlier about what substantiation meant, he was never able to substantiate that list. Uh, do you have two reasons why McCarthyism occurred in the late 1940s and 50s? Uh, so I've got four reasons here. So we've got a 1949 uh, USSR, which is uh, another word for the Soviet Union, tests their first atomic bomb. So America is now fearful that Russia is going to get an atomic bomb and it will be able to match their nuclear power. In 1949, China, uh, a massive country, also becomes communist. Um, also in 1949, uh, Truman orders background checks on every civilian, every civil service employee. And a member of the government named Alga, Kiss, Al Alga Hiss sorry, was convicted of being a communist spy. And then in 1950, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, were convicted of smuggling nuclear weapons information to the Soviet Union. Um, both were executed for this crime. Um, what did the HUAC do? So the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, their job was to search for communists working in the government, workplaces and in the media, especially the movie industry. They investigated millions of Americans, and although none were actually convicted, many were forced out of their jobs because of disgrace. Name two people or groups of people that were sacked slash blacklisted as a result of McCarthyism. So um, there was, I've got a few examples here. There are 10 famous Hollywood movie filmmakers who in 1947 refused to cooperate um, with the investigation because they thought uh, not that they were communists but they just thought they shouldn't have to cooperate with this investigation that had no basis and that it was un-American to restrict people's freedom to have the political beliefs they want to have um, and they were sentenced to a year in jail for contempt and uh, were really struggled to find work again after that. Another man, Charlie Chaplin, um, ended up leaving the country as a result of this. Uh, you may have heard of Charlie Chaplin, very famous film actor. Uh, so he had to leave the country and continue his career elsewhere. And also uh, we've got Alga Hiss, who we spoke about already. Uh, why did McCarthyism come to an end? After McCarthy accused 45 army officers, uh, he started to lose popularity because once you start accusing the army, people might not be so willing to go along with what you're saying. Uh, so he was actually asked to prove his accusations, which he was unable to do uh, because he never really had any proof for any of these. Um, so when he did, did this, he lost public support and the practice eventually faded away. Right, so those are those four questions. We're now going to move on to this exam style question. And you can see the way I've set it up to try and make it easy for you to see the way I would approach answering this question. As I put these brackets at the front here, so this is point evidence, explanation, evidence, explanation, and a link. So I've got, uh, we'll just go through this first one, shall we? So my point here is that McCarthyism had an impact on post-war American society by creating a culture of fear and suppression 
of any left-wing ideas in America. So that's my that's my point. Uh, and I, you can see here I've used tried to, my, to use the wording of the question. So the question is which of the following had more impact on post-war American society? So I've used the wording of impact on post-war American society, and I've named one of those two bullet points, and I've started with McCarthyism. Uh, then as an example, so for example, when the House Un-American Activities Committee started the search for communists in all areas of American life, including 10 Hollywood uh, filmmakers in 1947, American citizens could be blacklisted from their careers or sentenced to a year in jail for contempt if they refused to cooperate. And then I've got an explanation of why that changed American society. So as a result, many people began to fear what would happen if they were challenged by the HUAC and either left the country or did everything they could to not portray even the slightest left-wing view. So um, this sort of a clear explanation of how uh, the House on american Activities Committee um, affected American society by creating fear of people presenting themselves as left-wing in danger of being accused of being uh, far left, which is what communism is. Furthermore, uh, when Senator, so this is another piece of evidence, when Senator Joseph McCarthy claimed to have a list of 200 communists working in the government, a witch hunt against any potential communists within the government and private life, especially Hollywood, continued for the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, and then an explanation of that as well, which this showed, sorry, I'm on the wrong bit here. This meant that other politicians and public figures were too fearful to challenge McCarthy for fear that they might uh, be accused of communism. And so he was allowed to continue unchecked until he eventually accused 45 army officers and lost his popularity with the public. So again, we've got a piece of evidence showing how of uh, an example of how McCarthyism um, changed American society and an explanation of the impact of that. So we've got politicians and public figures refusing to challenge someone like McCarthy and then him able to just do whatever he wanted. Um, so we're running quite long on this one. So I'll just, I'll leave this here and you can pause it and you can have a read of what I've put for this one as well. But what I want to do now is talk about the conclusion. Uh, and this is really important in order to get the high marks. So what I've uh, done is I've included a clear judgment and explained an explanation of why I've made that judgment and I've tried to link those factors together as well. So my clear judgment straight up from the top, overall change in popular culture, including rock and roll and television had an impact on post or American society. So there's a clear judgment and I've included the wording of that question again. Uh, this was most important because it created a whole new generation of Americans who had more independence uh, who had more independence uh, and, sorry, I should say, and freedom than their parents did by listening to rock and roll music and following the examples of actors who portrayed rebellious American teens. They demonstrated a new, freer America that had never existed before. So I've made a judgment and I've substantiated it. Um, and then I've, this is where I uh, kind of link them together and talk about why uh, McCarthyism is less important in my view. This contrast to McCarthyism, which, whilst it certainly had a huge impact in creating political anxiety in America, the existence of the new rebellious team demonstrates that it was not as effective in restricting American society as it may have seemed. So what I've done there is I've talked about how if uh, the new emerging teenager was freer and more rebellious than ever before, then that uh, then McCarthyism can't have been as restricting on American society as potentially other people might view it as. Uh, and then I've also uh, mentioned that the collapse of McCarthyism in 1954 after McCarthy lost popularity following a failed attempt at accusing 45 army officers shows that, it, uh, that its impact was shortly lived, whilst the impact of rock and roll and television lasted far longer into the 21st century. So there I've got another another comparison between the two and how the impact of the change in popular culture made uh, a larger and longer lasting impact. 
So for this question, I've got those two, two peel paragraphs with lots of evidence and then a clear and substantiated judgment. So hopefully this has helped you with that sheet. Hopefully you got most of those all by yourself and you've got a much better understanding of anything that you didn't quite have just yet. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time.